you have a 65 year old male referred from gp for visible blood in the uh -huh. urine how are you going to evaluate him I would like to see him in my two week, two week wait hematuria clinic. I would like to take a, a pertinent history, uh, do an examination, and uh, pr arrange appropriate investigations. In my uh, history, I will ask about the duration, severity of his symptoms, any associated symptoms, any red flag symptoms like weight loss uh, or recurrent urinary tract infections, <clears throat> any uh, personal history of. Uh, um, smoking or working in the dye, in, uh, dye or paint industry, um, any uh, known history of um, previous cancers, any family history of uh, urological cancers, uh, followed by uh, past medical uh, general, uh, past medical surgical history, uh, assess his performance status, um, and inquire about any uh, treatment that he has had uh, for this hematuria before. Uh, I will then do a general physical examination in the presence of a chaperon, uh, looking for. Um, and then do an abdominal examination looking for any palpable viscera, examination of the genitalia and, and DRE if clinically appropriate. Uh, investigations, uh, I will uh, um, request urine dip, urine culture if there any signs of infection, uh, urine cytology, um, um, a, a CT, um, a urogram, and a flexible cystoscopy. Do you do CT urogram for all the hemisphere clinic patients? Um, so in my uh, unit, um, if there is um, a high suspicion of urological malignancies, then we will do it for uh, these patients. However, if it's a low uh, clinical suspicion of urological malignancies, then we, we will just do a ultrasound KUB. What are the conditions for which a GP can refer you a patient under two-week cancer pathway? Uh, so as per the NICE guidelines, uh, patients who are uh, 40 years of age, um, uh, sorry, 45 years of age um, uh, and above, patients with uh, persistent non-visible hematuria um, uh, uh, that reoccurs or, uh, is, uh, or, or stays after treatment uh, of appropriate uh, urinary tract infections, um, visible hematuria um, and patients above the age of uh, 60, uh, it's patients who have mm -hmm. persistent non-visible hematuria in the presence of dysuria or waste vessel count. What are the other conditions in which a GP can refer under two-week cancer pathway other than hematuria? And ele elevated PS, it's for different, uh, as for yeah. the NICE guidelines, there are various different mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, conditions in which the patients can refer as and a two-week wait pathway for elevated PSA for prostate cancer, for testicular cancer, uh, for kidney cancer, um, and for uh, uh, urothelial, urothelial malignancies. So this patient, as I said, presented with visible hematuria, yeah. and uh, you have the history, so he's attending the clinic. How will you construct your one-stop hematuria clinic? Is there any advantage of one-stop clinic? Um, the way I construct uh, uh, my one-stop hematuria clinic is when the patients come in in the morning, they have uh, they are uh, triaged by a specialist nurse, and patients who are high risk of uro urothelial malignancies go ahead and have a CT urogram. Patients who um, are low risk uh, get an ultrasound KUB, followed by a, a urine cytology and a cystoscopy uh, in the afternoon session. The advantage of uh, two-week hematuria clinic is streamlining of the patients and um, uh, arranging appropriate and timely investigations uh, of these, which will help in a diagnosis of uh, uh, urethral malignancies. What blood investigations you will do? Um, so I will uh, do an FPC and uh, urea uh, and electrolytes um, uh, as a baseline um, and also uh, as a prerequisite for a CT urogram. Is there any role for PSA? Um, patients who are referred with uh, um, um, symptoms of LUTs uh, uh, above the age of uh, 60, 60 uh, and patients who are appropriately counseled for these um, uh, are requested to have PSA. So will you do PSA for the patient which we are discussing? Um, I think if he's appropriately counseled uh, and he wants to have his PSA done, uh, then I will do it. Okay.
Uh, what is the importance of differentiating non-visible and visible hematuria? Um, uh, because visible hematuria uh, is um, more likely to be associated with uh, um, a, a more advanced or um, um, a malignancy of the uh, 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 urethral malignancy. I think that's the that's the the only advantage of differentiating uh, visible or non-visible hematuria. Okay. How does the urine dipstick works? Uh, so there are various different companies that uh, have produced uh, uh, urine dipsticks, and there is various parameters that can be checked on uh, urine dipsticks. Uh, the uh, the one that um, uh, we use is made by Merck and uh, has various different parameters like pH, specific gravity blood nitrites uh, 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 blood nitrites um, and uh, hemoglobin um, um, and there are different reagents that react to the substrates present in the in the urine and change color uh, due to which we can find if they are positive or negative if they're present in the urine or not Okay, especially for hematuria, what is the agent? What chemical change happens in dipstick? Um, so for hematuria, it's the peroxidase activity of uh, of hemoglobin that um, reacts with uh, a chromogen on the dipstick. Um, when will you get uh, false positive or false negative results? So for uh, false positive results, uh, it is going to be myoglobin urea, um, and for false negative results, it's uh, people who are taking vitamin C. Um, it's um, uh, can, can I just um, uh, add? Uh, it's the orthotoledine, or that's a reagent on the dipstick that changes color by the peroxidase activity of hemoglobin. Okay. And false negative. Um, so false and negative is going to be patients who are um, on vitamin C or reducing agents. Um, they can have false negative um, um, reaction on a urine dip for hematuria. So our patient has got visible hematuria, no specific uh, risk factors or significant family history noted. He has no other urinary symptoms. You said you want to arrange CT scan in the morning and arrange a flexible stroscopy in the evening. He had CT scan in the morning, which showed upper tracts normal, but in the bladder, he has got a papillary lesion on the right lateral wall. So he's attending your clinic in the afternoon. What will you do? So I will explain the results of his previous investigations to him, and I will explain, as per the balance information leaflet, the rationale and the risk factors of the flexible cystoscopy. Um, I, in my opinion, it would be a good idea to do a flexible cystoscopy to get a realistic um, idea of the location and the size of this tumor. Um, and then uh, if need be, plan further to URBT. I tend to explain this uh, as per the balance information leaflet and counsel these patients and the patients next of kin or relative uh, who might have uh, come along with the patient uh, and answer any questions required and arrange pre-op assessment as, need as needed. What is the role for urine cytology? So urine cytology um, has a um, high sensitivity uh, of picking up high-grade tumors, um, uh, but low specificity. Will you do cytology for our patient? Uh, for our patient, um, uh, I will not do a cytology as it is evident from his imaging that he has a bladder tumor. Uh, so you're doing flexible cystoscopy after obtaining consent and uh, it uh, proves the presence of the lesion which was found in the CT scan. What features you will look for when you're doing the flexible cystoscopy? So the features that I will look for is um, uh, the size, position in relation to the laterality, lateral walls and the ureteric orifice of this tumor. I would want to know if there's any other tumors that have not been, or any other abnormal mucosa that has not been picked up by the CT scan. Um, I will, uh, um, so position size uh, in relation to the lateral walls, uh, the ureteric orifice, 
uh, any uh, uh, if this lesion is in the diverticulum, any other mucosal abnormality, and um, the uh, size or capacity of the bladder as well. Okay. Any other markers or urine test you are aware of other than the cytology what we discussed? There are various two, uh, biochemical markers available in the market, but none of these are recommended by the NICE guidelines uh, for routine investigations for hematuria patients. Okay, we'll stop there. How do you think you did? Um, I think I uh, forgot uh, the exact wordings of the NICE guidelines for hematuria referral. Um, I think I got missed up, was it 40 years of age or 45 years of age? Um, the rest, I think, was a bit okay. Yeah, I mean, good performance, uh, no major concerns. Uh, as you said, uh, regarding the referral for two week pathway, this question can be asked anywhere because it's one of the good question to ask, like what are all the criteria with which a GP can refer you? Because if there is a patient referred inappropriately, you should be able to say that that is inappropriate, isn't it? Yes. Uh, I will send the uh, two-week paid referral form later in the group, but uh, you all know the usual thing, what you see routinely in your hematuria clinic or in any cancer clinic. So predominantly it is for the bladder and renal, it is unexplained visible hematuria without UTI more than 45 years or visible hematuria yes. um, which is persisting is even after UTI yeah. treatment after more than 45 years. Non-visible hematuria is more than 60 years. So in essence, okay. the big change is anybody with non-visible hematuria will require a referral only if they are more than 60 years. Between 45 to 60, it will be predominantly only visible hematuria, whether treated with previous UTI or okay. it is unexplained visible hematuria. And for kidneys, palpable renal lesion or lesion in the imaging, whether it's CT scan or um, ultrasound, Testes, again, the swelling in the body of the testes. It's not epididymis. 50% of our referrals were all epididymal cysts and epididymal swellings, but the criteria wise, it's only testicular body swelling. Penile, again, it's the swelling or the mass or ulcerated lesion in the foreskin or the glands. Nothing to do with the shaft of the penis. Prostate, abnormal DRE findings or if the DRE is normal, raised PSA as per the age specific, the easiest way to remember is uh, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, 70 to 79. Four groups, the values were more than 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, and 6.5, just jumping on the 5.5, just remember like that. So 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, the PSA value correspondingly 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, 6.5. That's you need to skip the 5.5. It's very easy to remember. A lot of people may say, even in the exam, like anybody more than 3.5, there is a guidelines to that. But if you stick to any one of the guidelines, that will be good. And uh, sometimes this basic scenario will be slightly boring because it deals with a lot of urine cytology and various other things also. Uh, I'm happy with your construction of the one-stop clinic so that the patient will come in the morning, have the imaging done, which will be very handy during the flexible stroscopy and to make a complete dissection decision in the same clinic. Non-visible hematurias, um, you need to know the uh, less importance, but at the same time, it can be important in people more than 60 years, as we said. Regarding the PSA, anybody with hematuria, along with urinary symptoms or erectile dysfunction, you can do PSA. Appropriate counseling is fine, but if the patient has symptomatic uh, uh, urinary symptoms, male patient, PSA has a role. And if PSA done, it has to be done before the flexible cystoscopy. When discussing the urine dipstick, there is no need for you to bring any uh, pharmacology, pharmacist or pharmacology company's name. You just have to say what agent and how it works and uh, you did correct as far as the hematuria is concerned. False positive can happen even with menstrual cycle. And uh, so just be very comfortable with the false positive and false negative ones. And um, the false negative, the other commonest reason is the transit. Usually um, if the transit takes a long time that can cause false negative, uh, happens in the GP surgery. And regarding the cytology, uh, you can say that I won't do cytology. There is nothing wrong in it, but 
performing cytology is equally good because if the cytology is positive it means it's a high grade tumor so that will give you a little bit of uh, idea when you're going for resection etc anyway this patient had a positive lesion both in the ct scan and in your cystoscopy and uh, uh, you should be a little bit aware of the other alternative urinary markers like nuclear matrix 1422, bladder tumor associated antigen, BTA antigen, telomerase, and Eurovision test. Just know a little bit, like for example, fluorescent in situ hybridization is utilized in Eurovision, which diagnoses the aneuploidy of chromosomes 3, 7, 17, and loss of 9p21. These things will really boost your value because it gives a lot of respect from the examiner that you have were able to memorize and remember a lot of things. So you should know a little bit about the alternative urinary markers more in detail. Okay. Okay. Good. Can we go for the next scenario? Who is presenting? Uh, yes, please. Good. Thank you. Now, the patient who was seen in the previous scenario, um, he is going to attend the TRBT with you. You are the operating surgeon and you are doing a pooled list and so the patient lands up in your data. How are you going to approach the patient in the morning and take it forward? Uh, yeah, first of all, I will, I will um, uh, review the patient's notes, uh, his images and his cystoscopy report about uh, to confirm the position of the tumor which was found and uh, the location in relation to the teric orifices and if there is any satellite uh, legion, so I can um, uh, make an you know appropriate order of the list. I will um, uh, consent him using a bounds information uh, leaflet, mention the name of the procedure, the intended benefit and the side effects, specific side effects, including this procedure that um, uh, risk of uh, bleeding infection and a certain complication, very small risk of uh, bladder perforation. That's one to two percent require other conservative management or uh, open uh, repair and uh, risk of incomplete uh, resection need additional surgery, risk of uh, adjuvant treatment. Like uh, mitomycin afterwards, if it's, if it's found to be uh, uh, papillary. Uh, I will uh, ask him to sign, uh, give him a copy and keep a copy for myself and uh, do the WHO checklist with the anesthetist and uh, proceed accordingly. Is there any other methods available to improve your sensitivity and specificity of T or BT? Any specific cystoscopy methods available? Uh, yes, um, uh, there is uh, two methods uh, used. There is a uh, blue light cystoscopy, photodynamic cystoscopy, and there is the narrow banding image. So how does it work? Uh, the photodynamic cystoscopy we, uh, um, works by uh, using um, a special agent that's the uh, paramino acid or the Hexfix, uh, the other alternative. It's installed in the bladder, left in the bladder for about um, uh, 30 minutes to an hour. And then under blue light, uh, the urethelial cancer cells will be uh, shine as, as as pink as it's uptake, uh, uh, uptaken the the, the, the the agent and the resection uh, done under uh, white light. Um, the other um, technology is the neurobanding imaging, uh, which uh, essentially is enhanced in a hypervascularized urethelial uh, cancer tissue uh, by filtering the white light into a blue and green. The blue light does penetrate and the green light does reflect and the, and that's what we, we normally see in the neurobanding imaging. And it's normally the wavelength of a blue light and uh, neurobanding imaging is between around 400 to 523 uh, nanometers in that range. Okay. And um, you are using a rigid scope for this. Is the blue light or narrowband imaging possible using a flexible cystoscope? Um, the neurobanding images, yes, I'm aware there are flexible cystoscopy using neurobanding images. I cannot recall if there is a blue light uh, in the uh, flexible cystoscopy uh, setup. Okay, 
And now uh, the patient is uh, in front of you, you are consenting, as you said, you explained the side effects of the procedure and the uh, patient is now anesthetized and uh, draped and sterile. What is your next steps into your BT? Uh, yeah, first of all, I do uh, by manual examination, uh, uh, pre-TRBT, then proceed using a 26 uh, French resectoscope, do a systematic diagnosis of soscopy, then I, uh, I locate the tumor and inner satellite legion. Then I proceed to fractionated meal uh, uh, piece um, TRPT to the exophytic tumor sent in a separate pot. And I do a deep biopsy to the tumor base and that sent separately. And I um, ensure adequate hemostasis with rollable. If it is a uh, uh, papillary towards the end after I insert my catheter, I perform intraoperative uh, uh, mitomycin, that's 40 milligram in 40 ml of saline. If it is incomplete resection or appears solid, I don't do that. And I uh, commence irrigation afterwards with uh, repeat of by manual towards the end. Okay, so you said few things in the order. Is there anything specific guideline or anything available in this context? Uh, yes. Uh, um, I'm aware that the, the AU guidelines have outlined the best approach of uh, 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 TRBT practice. And I'm also aware about a uh, recent study by BURST about the uh, appropriate practice or the ideal practice for um, uh, adequate, adequate uh, TRBT. Okay. As you know, our patient has got lesion in the right lateral wall. Any specific Special precautions you need to take? Uh, yes, preoperatively, I will warn my anesthetist that the patient ideally should have uh, general anesthetic with paralysis, uh, unless it's contraindicated, and that's to minimize the risk of uh, interoperative bladder perforation, secondary to obturate the kick. And I will use, uh, if that is the case, I use um, uh, bipolar diathermy in my practice, uh, alternatively, monopolar diathermy in a low setting uh, with underfilled bladder can be used to minimize the risks as well. Okay. And uh, in case if the patient is not fit for GA, what are all the options available? If the patient is not for GA, uh, other alternative that, uh, under spinal, but with obturator uh, nerve block, that's one of the uh, alternative has been um, uh, described in the literature with experience and ethics. Good. So your patient's histology is ready. You're going to discuss it in your MDT. The histology is grade two, high grade PTA uh, TCC of the bladder. So what further things you will look for? How will you discuss it in your MDT? Um, in the histology report, I would like to note the uh, size resected. If there is any other satellite legion, uh, if the muscle is present, if there is lymphovascular invasion, if there is any uh, a variant uh, uh, histology uh, in the in the in the tissue, and if it was complete or incomplete resections or not, and our risk is stratified according to the nice risk stratification criteria. Okay, uh, could you take me through the nice uh, risk stratification? Uh, yes, for uh, low risk uh, group, that's. Uh, 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 G, uh, grade one or grade two, low risk uh, PTA, less than uh, three centimeter and uh, single uh, uh, grade three, the, uh, the high risk is the grade three or high risk grade two or CIS or T1 disease and anything in between that's uh, grade two. So basically it's a multifocal uh, uh, G1 or G2 uh, or more than three centimeter. Uh, how will you classify the grading of the tumor? Uh, the grading of the tumor, um, so that's either uh, grade, grade one or grade two or grade three. That's according to the tissue differentiation. If it's uh, well differentiated, that's grade one. Grade two, that's moderately differentiated. And grade three, that's uh, fully differentiated. Is there any new system available for this grading? Um, um, I'm not sure, but I think that's the ISUP criteria, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. 
how will you stage this patient uh, for example t staging what is the uh, yeah, staging so, uh, t tnm staging uh, t uh, t0 no t tcis uh, that's carcinoma in situ ta that's in the epithelium t1 uh, subepithelial but does not involve the muscular uh, the, the muscle t2 uh, a and b a uh, in, uh, might uh, improve the lamina propria t2 uh, b that's the muscularis uh, t3 a and b uh, that's the peripezycle tissue either microscopically or macroscopically in t3 b and t4 a and b uh, a that's involved the uh, uh, bladder, neck, or prostate, or vagina, and D four B does uh, involve the pelvic wall. And then for the uh, N classification, uh, N uh, zero no nodes one two three, one is a single node in the true pelvis, uh, two um, is uh, bilateral or mul uh, multiple nodes in the true pelvis, and three that's outside the true pelvis in the common alic bifurcation. M staging, and then M, yeah. uh, M is staging, yeah, uh, M, 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 X, and M1, if uh, M1 is metastatic. Uh, can you divide M1 also, A and B? Uh, a and B, uh, not regional lymph node in, 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 uh, in A, and B is a bone, uh, bone mess or uh, organ mess. Okay, that's good. So 10 minutes gone now. How do you think you did? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it was it was it was good. Maybe I should have just um, been a bit a little faster, but we covered a lot of uh, points. Um, yeah. I'm not aware of uh, the blue light in flexible source. Presumably, it does exist, but I haven't I haven't seen it. Um, yeah. But apart from uh, that, yeah. Good presentation. Or no concerns. Very nice. A uh, few things you can be quite clear. The five amino levulonic acid installation is for one hour. Uh, no 30 minutes. It's better to leave it for clearly one hour. And uh, it works well with the rigid cystoscope, but there is a possibility you can do with flexible cystoscope also, but the cystoscope should have the ability to have the blue light capacity. And uh, you should be able to say that it just by one switch, you can change between the blue light and white light. You should be able to come out with that answer. And uh, the flexible cystoscopy is available only in the form of a trial purposes. As of now, it's available in London, but uh, digital cystoscope, this technology can be used anywhere in the country. And uh, blue light actual wavelength is 375 to 440. Uh, you made it a little bit uh, general, like 400 to 450, nothing wrong. Um, not too much deviated from the correct answers. Regarding narrow band imaging, you can say, the Olympus scope stack system has got this narrowband imaging while in stores stack system, it is called a spectra. So both the options are available. Um, you need to bring in somehow the research trial and EAU guidelines, uh, specifications on good practice in TURBT. Even if the examiner is not asking, if you bring these things that gives you a more meat to the answer, otherwise it will be a very box standard, uh, like a ST3, ST4 interview question. And uh, okay. I've just sent the EAU best practices article from 2000, I think 2021, I think, which is a good article yeah. to go through. A very simple one. And uh, good that you brought in the burst. Uh, we are doing the research study. The results were not yes. out. So once the yeah. research study is released, you will get more information on that. Uh, any tumor on the lateral wall, like right lateral, you can bring the operator kick yourself that you'll be very cautious about it. But even if examiner asks, you can bring in the bipolar energy source. You can also reduce the voltage. You can also take the swipes in smaller bits rather than taking one big bit. And you'll yeah. be extra cautious when doing the deep resection for muscle. Possibly without using the current, you can take a cold cup biopsy and do a very cautious uh, diathermy for coagulation. Yeah. Regarding the grading, the grade one, grade two, grade three, well differentiated, moderately differentiated, poorly differentiated belongs to 1973 WHO grading. The latest one is the 2004 ISUP, International Society for Europatologist grading, which divides the grade one into one LMP, which is papillary urethral neoplasia of low, molecular, low malignant potential, 
and low grade. While grade two is divided into low grade and high grade, grade three is always high grade. So remember 2004 ISUP grading system, which divides into PUNLMP and low grade and high grade. Those are the four grades. PUNLMP is considered almost like a benign, nothing much to do. A low grade, not many pathologists are reporting. It's mostly it's a high grade is reported. And uh, you can use the NICE guidelines stratification. And uh, it, it's easier to say, like, uh, you can differentiate NICE and EAU, or you can just mention any one of them. EAU is more straightforward. You can say low risk, you can say high risk, and you can say that everything not in low or high risk belongs to the intermediate risk. And try to bring in the EORTC GUCG scoring system because uh, you can stop up to the scoring system. That is the best way. The scoring system will is very, very good for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Regarding the staging, you're quite good with uh, TNM. Uh, the M staging alone, M1A is non-regional lymph nodes, while M1B is of distant metastasis. Um, yeah, yeah, otherwise quite straightforward. And so the main take home are 2004 ISUP grading system and uh, EORTC uh, risk stratification and be more clear in your risk stratification. You can say we have the stratification from NICE and EAU guidelines. I will take EAU guidelines as an example. So whichever is convenient to you, you can take it as an example and then uh, go ahead, okay? Fine, though. and just one last thing, the, the, the wavelength yeah. of the, you said the exact yeah, number was five, three, 500? No, blue length is 375 to 440. Uh, but you have averaged it and okay. you said 400 to 450. Uh, it's not a bad answer, but uh, know some values because this is good at this point, but uh, you maybe next time when you're presenting, yeah. you can make it more specific and more clearer because you can't remember too many things also, yeah. isn't it? So 400 to 450 mm -hmm. is, is a perfectly no, acceptable yeah. answer. No problem with that. No. Okay. No good. Lovely. Lovely. Thank can we Thank go for the next person who is ready? Uh, if nobody is uh, ready, Sami, are you happy to continue? I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, Saswata is ready. Good. Okay, Saswata, your time starts now. The patient who we have just finished the MDT discussion, as I said, it's a G2 high grade PT1. And uh, what you will decide on further treatment, the tumor is completely resected and uh, patient is quite fit otherwise, patient had mitomycin uh, post-surgery, how will you take this uh, treatment further? Well, I will discuss uh, with this patient the options uh, uh, in presence of a nurse specialist, the options being upfront radical cystectomy or uh, intravesical BCG treatment uh, and will uh, take a preference of his decision and then take it forward. Okay. What specific things you will look in the histology to make sure that we have got the correct specimen and enough specimen? Well, I will see whether the muscle is present or not. And if he has uh, not had a relook, the another option is to go in for a second look. Okay. And um... Regarding BCG, how will you explain this to the patient? What are all the strains of BCG available? Well, uh, the strain, it is a, a, a live attenuated uh, vaccine of Mycobacterium bovis. Uh, it, this, uh, uh, this, there are strains like on, uh, Oncotize, Connor, RIVM strains, and these uh, are being instilled into the bladder. Uh, and kept for two hours and then the patient voids in a commode seating down and then washes with unbleached dye and these are given uh, six uh, weekly for the induction and then for maintenance is given at three months uh, three weekly and six months and then every six months until three years and 
in with intervening flexible cystoscopies to see if there is a recurrence. How does this BCG therapy works? Well, a BCG therapy, uh, once it is instilled into the bladder, it gets uh, internalized, it gets attached to fibronectin and gets internalized and then activates a cell mediated immunity and macrophage chemotaxis to destroy tumor cells. Okay, so is there any evidence for this PCG? Yes, there is a Sylvester et al. evidence showing a reduction in uh, progression from uh, a, a relative reduction of 27% and an absolute reduction of 4%. So you are starting this patient on BCG. He tolerated the induction course very well, but uh, on the next course, he was really struggling with uh, storage, uh, urinary symptoms, frequency both day and night. How can you help him? Well, in this case, I have to, uh, again, reassess him with the urine dipstick to see whether he has any uh, infections going. and. Uh, uh, at the same time, would like to assess his urinary symptoms. Uh, and if it is an infection, I would treat uh, it with an antibiotic, which does not affect, uh, which is not an antituberculous drug to minimize the effect of tuberculosis a vaccine. So which commonest antibiotic you should avoid? Is ciprofloxacin, okay. any quinolones. Okay, if the patient improves from this, how long you need to give, how many total installations he may require? Well, the installations are been uh, as suggested by LAM. It is a total of 27 installation. After the induction, then the maintenance a dose where at three months he gets a, a three weekly, uh, weekly three such, and then at six months again three such, and then six monthly for uh, uh, three years. So it's a total what of 27 the... installations. Okay, what are the contraindications of BCG? The contraindications are active infection, uh, any immunocompromised state, active bleeding, uh, two weeks after TRBT, and mm, if the patient has incontinence uh, in pregnancy and breastfeeding patients, and a traumatic catheterization. Okay, can you give BCG in a liver disease patient like uh, cirrhosis? No, because I mean, uh, if he has uh, an active tuberculosis after giving BCG, isoniazid cannot be given. So this is contraindicated in patients with liver cirrhosis. Okay. So how this patient needs further follow-up, uh, how will you quantify this patient's BCG response? And uh, what are the various ways you can say that the BCG has failed? What happens with that? Well, there are three uh, ways. Um, uh, I mean, it will all be with the BCG maintenance and flexible cystoscopy and what we see as a recurrence. And then he will require a QRBT to see what grade of recurrence it is. So one is a BCG relapse, one is BCG refractory, and the other is BCG unresponsive. So in a BCG relapse, I mean, after total maintenance, uh, he has a high grade uh, relapse. In that case, it is a BCG relapse. And in a BCG refractory, uh, there is a high grade or a CIC in three or six months. And BCG unresponsive is a high grade uh, in patients with adequate exposure to BCG which is an induction, adequate exposure is induction and a single maintenance dose. Okay, what are the indications for re-resection, ERBT? 
the indications are all high grade tumors, a T1 tumors. Uh, I mean, the TRBT specimen where muscle is not present. And yeah, the, these are the, uh, yes, these are the ones which will require re resection. Why you need to do re resection for T1 tumors? Because it can uh, upgrade to 30% and there can be residual disease uh, in 35 to 55%. Okay. Now, when you will decide that this patient is not responding to BCG and if so, what will you do? The patient is not responsive to BCG. Uh, if it is a high grade uh, recurrence, he will be up for a radical cystectomy which will be, I mean, discussed uh, before in the MDT before we discuss with the patient. Okay. And uh, how will you treat the patients uh, with symptoms due to BCG, like frequency of urination and nighttime frequency, nocturia, how can you help them? Well, if it is an active BCG uh, sepsis that needs to be uh, tackled with antibiotics and then refer to the respiratory physicians for their treatment with the antituberculous medication. If it is, uh, uh, there is, um, an in, uh, the, if the patient is intolerant, we can try with some uh, NSAIDs to see if that helps uh, or else uh, we, if, if, if the patient cannot tolerate, then the alternatives like uh, giving intravesical installation with gemcitabin and cisplatin or interferon uh, 50 micrograms plus a half dose of BCG or else one third dose of a BCG can be given as alternatives as, but uh, they are all uh, inferior to the full dose. What is bladder CAS? Uh, CIS is actually a high grade non invasive flat tumor. So, anything specific you will do for it compared to the transitional cell cancers? Uh, BCG, I mean, uh, CIS can be treated with either an upfront uh, cystectomy or intravesical BCG, which prevents its progression. That's good. We can stop there. How do you think you did? I think I got the line of management all right, I think. I'm not sure what you yeah. say. No, it's good. You really maintained a very good pace, clear in communication, and uh, I'm happy with your answers. Uh, it's the first time I'm examining you. I'm very happy and very standard answers. A um, few things for how you can improve is, for example, you said nurse specialist. You can quantify them as cancer nurse specialist. No need okay. to say maculin, but you can make it more quantifying. Again, okay. uh, BCG has to be left for two hours. You can complete that sentence by saying that every 30 minutes, I will ask the patient to roll around so that it will touch all the bladder layers. There is no big evidence to that. Maybe there are some small evidence to say that it's not much useful. But it's a good practice. If the patient can roll around or move around, it will touch all the bladder mucosa. And um, BCG works by the pathway of interleukin-6 and interleukin-8. That those things you can remember that will give you more marks. You correctly mentioned about Sylvester trial with uh, risk reduction and absolute risk reduction. You can further improve the answer by saying that it's a meta-analysis by Sylvester which includes mm -hmm. 24 trials and 4,800 patients published in 2002. So mm. every time when you answer, your answer should be better than your previous performance. As you slowly improve the, the meat in the answer, that will give you more confidence and that's how you can learn. You can't learn everything in one sitting. So mm. from this presentation to the next presentation of the same bladder cancer, you will be more knowledgeable and your answers will be more complete. And uh, contraindications, liver disease, that's correct. You haven't brought that, so I asked you. So, then, yeah, so those I forgot that, actually. Yeah, so mm. you should be able to come out uh, 
a spontaneously active tuberculosis is a contraindication for BCG. Mm. And uh, those who are suffering from BCG, you can also treat it as any other storage or voiding a UTS. So there is a mm. place for um, anticholinergics or mirabegron or alpha blockers once the UTI is ruled out. Mm -hmm. Again, when you are discussing CIS, you can bring in the Sylvester meta analysis because it suggested that BCG is superior to mitomycin C for treating BCG. Yes. Treating the CIS one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. So we'll go for the last scenario. Who is available? If not, I may. I'm available, sir. If no one else oh, is good. Johan. Okay, Joe. Uh, good. So, the patient which we have treated now, uh, he performed well with BCG. He completed like uh, a year and a half of BCG. He was quite symptomatic. As discussed in the last scenario, we have tried to treat him with uh, anticholinergics, alpha blockers, and changing the BCG regimen, et cetera, but his symptom is quite intolerable. And his follow-up flexibrostoscopy showed a recurrence in the lesion, and uh, he had the TRBT, which showed G3, high-grade, PT2, TCC of the bladder. So what will you do now? So this gentleman initially had uh, BCG intolerance, had a recurrence or a relapse on BCG, and then was diagnosed with a muscle invasive bladder tumor on his recent biopsy. Um, I will uh, now discuss his um, case in the MDT and then present the options of treatment to the patient. Uh, with a high-grade muscle invasive tumor, his options broadly will be uh, between a radical cystectomy, ileal conduit or content diversion, and uh, radiotherapy. Um, I, I don't know if there was CIS in the specimen, but I will uh, I will counsel him between these two options. Okay, so his uh, diagnosis, as I said, is only G3 grade PT, PT2. And uh, how will you guide and counsel the patient between, say, ill conduit and new reconstruction? What feature will go through with the patient? So I, I'd uh, look at his performance and health status. I'd, um, I'd look at uh, his um, hand dexterity if he was to have a, a, di a continent diversion. I will also um, uh, look at his other uh, medical history, whether he's had previous radiotherapy, if he's had abdominal operations, if he's got uh, significant low tract symptoms or a, a benign enlarged prostate, and if his PSA is uh, normal or high. Um, Apart from this, I will also speak to the patient about the uh, complications and what he can expect you know, between uh, surgery and radiotherapy. Um, with uh, surgery, he will experience uh, um, um, likely experience erectile dysfunction. If he has a, a continent diversion, uh, there may be urinary incontinence. He might have to use a, a clean intermittent self catheterization. Um, if he has a, a conduit, uh, he'll have to uh, get used to using a bag. Um, to avoid urine. If he has uh, um, radiation, the effects uh, will be delayed. He has a high chance of having uh, proctitis, cystitis, which would mean existing LUTs might get worse. He might have bleeding per rectum. Um, later complications could be bowel issues, including and also secondary malignancies from the radiation several uh, years down the line. So in which patients you will think or consider about this erection preserving neobladder reconstruction or radical cystectomy? Uh, so these will have to be young patients who have existing uh, good erectile function. Uh, if we are doing a continent uh, procedure simultaneously, I'll also have to consider his hand dexterity and his willingness to perform uh, clean intermittent catheterization, should that be necessary, which it, which it well may be. Uh, also, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd not, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Is there any scoring system available for you to quantify the patient's comorbidity? Uh, there is a Charlson's comorbidity index, and we also use WHO performance status. The Charlson's comorbidity index, uh, uh, if it's less than, I mean, if it's more than one, that's uh, it's a bad predictor of overall uh, morbidity from the operation based on comorbidities alone. And the WHO performance status is something we, we assess in the, um, in the outpatients to see how much uh, effort tolerance the patient has and what kind of activities it does on its own. Okay. 
So, Charlson's comorbidity index. Can you explain the scoring system? Um, so, it it looks through features such as diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. I think there are about eight factors there. I'm I'm not sure of the specifics. I think it's if it's more than one, it's predictive of uh, having a more um, physiological complications from an interventional procedure. Okay. And can you explain the WHO performance status? Uh, so um, WHO performance of zero is, um, sorry, of one is um, uh, when the patient has normal effort tolerance and activity. Uh, if it's, uh, it's two, I think it's, um, is able to do most uh, activities of daily living and may need some, uh, some help. And three is dependent on others to help with his daily activities. Four is uh, uh, bedridden and unable to perform uh, daily activities. And I think five is pre-morbid or morbid. Okay. So how will you prepare this patient? The patient is happy for radical cystectomy with the neobladder reconstruction. He's uh, quite fit otherwise. He's 65 year old, no medical comorbidities other than the bladder cancer, which is troubling him for the past two years. How will you prepare this patient for the surgery? So I will um, go through uh, the procedure with him based on the BAUS patient information leaflet. And if I was consenting, I use a procedure-specific consent form. The issues to discuss with him specifically are one, that this is an operation with a fairly high morbidity uh, between one and three uh, percent, sorry, uh, mortality between one and three percent. Um, there will be significant anesthetic risks uh, up to um, 0.2 to 5, 0.2 to, sorry, 0.5 to 2 percent. Uh, in terms of um, the operation, the chances of having a, a bleeding and infection, infection intra-abdominally in the wound and in the urine after the operation, um, a bleeding that may need transfusion in up to uh, 2 to 3 percent. Um, he, sorry, more than that, I think it's 5 to 10 percent. Um, he may need an ITU stay, immediate post-op for one or two days while, uh, while his physiology settles. Um, I will also talk to him about uh, specific complications from the operation, where there, there's a chance of um, leak from the bowel, uh, leak from the uh, bowel urinary anastomosis, um, and um, erectile uh, dysfunction, uh, incontinence, the need later on to have, uh, have uh, clean intermittent self-catheterization. Um, oh, sorry, I can't think of anything else at the moment. Any other specific test available to make sure the patient's yes. fitness for surgery? Yeah. Yes, I'd uh, refer him for a, a couple of things. One is a CPET testing, which is cardiopulmonary exercise tolerance testing to, to uh, quantify how well his tolerance is to exercise and his anaerobic performance. And the second one is I will also refer him to the early recovery uh, um, ERAS protocol so the nurses can um, brief him, start up his physiotherapy and prepare him uh, for the operation. What does ERA stands for? Um, early, I think it's early recovery. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's survival. I'm not very sure. Can you define anaerobic threshold? Um, so anaerobic threshold is when you put this patient on an exercise uh, uh, bike. Uh, there is a there is a cutoff which is um, generated based on his uh, uh, potential. I'm I'm not extremely sure. And um, how will you take this patient further? So this patient has been for your enhanced recovery nurse appointment. They have given all the information. Your CPEX test uh, seems to be good. Patient's uh, anaerobic threshold is like 14. Um, anything above 11 is uh, acceptable. So how will you take this treatment further? Uh, so once we've counseled, then I'll consent him for the operation. And um, on, on the day of the surgery, he'll have... Uh, um, Carbohydrate loading as part of the ERAS uh, protocol. Um, at the op uh, at the uh, operation, uh, am I to describe the steps of the operation? Am I in the right direction? Yeah, you are in the right direction. Go ahead. Okay. So, at the operation, there will be a team brief, and once we complete the the WHO checklist with the patient, we're prepped and draped uh, um, adequately. Um, I I proceed with the um, with the with an open radical cystectomy, um, patient in the thought me position. Um, uh, the incision would be a, a midline a midline incision up to the umbilicus. Uh, we'd um, expose the, uh, I mean, 
go through the peritoneum, find the uracus, uh, dissect that down to the bladder. Um, I'd have to find the, the, the vas um, on both sides and then identify the ureters. Um, once the ureters have been uh, dissected off, I'd, uh, I would uh, tie them and keep them away from the rest of the cystectomy field and um, proceed with the, with the cystectomy and the uh, prostectomy with the plane behind the rectum and then releasing anteriorly uh, away from the uh, preperitoneal space and laterally to ligate the pedicle sequentially. Uh, once the, that is um, once that is done, I, I will be um, um, preserving uh, the just beyond the apex of the prostate. I'll be sure to I'll, I'll make uh, provision to uh, safeguard the the sphincter as much as possible. Uh, I'll have to take a, a segment of bowel uh, for reconstruction. Uh, in this case, about sixty centimeters, twenty centimeters away from the IC junction. Um, use a Studer uh, um, procedure uh, to um, configure the bowel uh, and uh, the chimney will be for the uh, ureteric anastomosis and the breaker technique. Um, that's all I can think of at the moment. Okay, good. We will stop here. Uh, it's 10 minutes now. You did very well. It's quite an advanced scenario. And also uh, for you, since you're presenting the first time, this is a very, very good presentation and good starting. You Thank can you. get only better from here. Yes. Um, uh, again, the things which you understand, I think you are reproducing very, very good. But things which you need to really mug up and just memorize the, the raw facts, you are a bit struggling. So mm -hmm. those things you need to uh, maybe write in a, like a, like a posters and twist it in your wall and yes. go through them again and again and again. For example, Charlson's comorbidity index, it ranges from zero to 30. And uh, there is a score of one, two, three, four, five, six. One for the simple diseases like diabetes, stroke, uh, ulcer, COPD, etc. Two for age 60 to 61 to 70, localized tumor, lymphoma, end stage renal failure. Three for severe renal disease. Four for advanced age like 81 to 90. So like that, the uh, score increases and yes. the total score will go up to 30. Okay. So it's a very good one. EAU guidelines heavily supports using Charles Stalson's comorbidity index compared to WHO. You're quite good in explaining the WHO, that's good. See, but testing your way of explaining is correct, but I literally pulled you to tell the CPEX testing, so you should remember to say that. Yes. Anaerobic threshold is, is very simple. What's happening is normally a man with good oxygen supply, good lung capacity will have an aerobic metabolism. Aerobic yes. metabolism is the best metabolism of utilizing the oxygen and producing less amount of toxic excretory materials. Yes. But if the patient is pushed to the higher metabolic challenge, the oxygen utilization won't be enough and patients shift from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. Once the anaerobic metabolism in the body is switched on, that's where the acidosis producers, for example, even if you, without proper practice, go for a 5K run or something like that, you will get cramps in the muscle. It's because of the lactic acid accumulation. It's a part of anaerobic metabolism. So the point at which the patient gets into this anaerobic metabolism is known as anaerobic threshold. The threshold is 11 ml per kg per minute. Anything more than 11 ml means that's good. Anything less than 11 ml means patient's threshold is quite low. That you can keep in mind. And yes. uh, uh, erectile dysfunction preserving or erection preserving radical cystectomy is a little bit on the higher end. Since you mentioned this, I need to ask that. But nothing wrong in it. Uh, if the patient is suitable, you can go for the nerve preserving um, radical cystectomy. And there are also concepts of prostate preserving radical cystectomy. I prefer not to bring all these high stuffs into the discussion unless if you're very sure you're able to bring things like the tumor present uh, in the bladder lumen, the trigone is not affected. And uh, those are all the patients where you can even go for prostate specific, prostate preserving, which is good in erectile dysfunction preserving also. So those are all for very niche specific young patients, as you said, those who have already got good erectile function. On enhanced recovery protocol, you can be a little bit more uh, in depth in it. So there is a specific team. The team is not just urology specific, 
they will be taking care of enhanced recovery protocol for urology like uh, kidney tumors prostate tumors and bladder tumors for the bladder tumors and rplnd the role is very important similarly they may be quite handy in patients who are undergoing like uh, pelvic excentration or or um, like uh, right hemicolectomy total colectomy all those major patients so as per the protocol they will admit the patient on the morning of the surgery not necessarily for the day before try to avoid enema try to keep nil by mouth only for the limited 6 hours period try to keep the patient on hydration as much as possible and uh, give the glucose load which will be very useful to face the anaerobic uh, threshold whatever anaerobic challenge with the patient going to underwent during the surgery and post op also the treatment will continue by making sure they are getting appropriate uh, pulmonary physiotherapy appropriate vt prophylaxis early mobilization try to remove the nasogastric tube as early as possible there is no need there is no real evidence to keep the nasogastric tube in till the patient passes platus as long as the abdomen is soft even if the bubble sounds are heard we can take the chance of removing the nasogastric tube provided the surgeon is happy with all the intraoperative events like bowel anastomosis everything so those kind of things you can spend a little bit more on enhanced recovery protocol and the, the one glaring thing which is a uk based practice is neoadjuvant chemotherapy so many trusts strictly follow that there is a good role for neoadjuvant chemotherapy either it's uh, gc gemcitabine and cisplatin or mvac methotrexate pinblastin adriamycin and cisplatin regimen it's very good there is a good evidence to say that it improves the overall outcome it will not affect the surgical comorbidity and especially if the patients are fit for cisplatin the patients will be having a better outcome advanced blaze the bladder cancer study abc released in 2005 showed 5% of absolute improvement in 5 year survival and hence it is incorporated into 2020 nice guidelines and aau guidelines also recommends uh, all the years you can say even 2022 aau guidelines and uh, so a patient should be seen by the oncologist and then neoadjuvant chemotherapy is started and then patient goes for radical cystectomy there is no much role for post operative adjuvant chemotherapy as long as the specimens are quite acceptable the next question if you have little bit more fast in the presentation will be like what is the extent of the lymph node dissection and we can divide it into like a standard lymph nodes up to bifurcation of common um, common iliac arteries and then extended up to the bifurcation of the aorta and then supra extended up to the level of uh, intramesenteric artery at that point we need to make sure that whether the surgery is really required and uh, whether we are going to give a good clearance or not um good improvement good uh, presentation from here you can only improve further regarding the studer reconstruction you are taking 60 cm of ileum which is 20 cm away from the ileocecal junction when you say that i wish you to complete it by telling that we are preserving the distal 20 cm or 15 cm to make sure there is no vitamin b12 deficiency vitamin b12 absorption is maintained yes. and that 20 cm you can make the 40 cm into the neo bladder construction and 20 cm as a chimney and the ureters can be uh, implanted into that uh, every sentence there is a scope to make it a better sentence so that's yes. the whole idea of the whole exercise all the four scenarios the close observations when i'm sending you the recording is to see okay this sentence how can i reframe it better this sentence how can i bring more facts into it more publication details into it and if i bring more facts and publications the time is the constraint so how can i reduce the number of sentences and bring the same information so from now onwards till the exam i think that is the main thing you all have i think enough knowledge to pass the main thing is how to make it more comprehensive but good presentation i have no concerns with any four of you uh, any questions from the four before we complete today no sir thank you very much good if there is no further questions uh, we can complete it today and uh, i uh, we will keep continuing with oncology possibly next we will go for like uh, testicular cancers because penile cancers we have done before so we'll go for testicular cancers and then we'll go with the 
Adios. Good. No, thank you.